This year, we started physics with an investigation of the motion of toy cars moving on a table. This video is going to conclude that lab, and in it, we're going to try to reach a consensus about what these different representations of motion that we came up with uh, mean and how we can apply what we've learned to things in general that move like toy cars. So our big exploration question for this lab was, how can we describe the motion of the toy cars with words, with diagrams, with graphs, and equations? So at this point, you've already, each of your lab groups have taken data, have collected it, and you've come up with words to describe the motion of your car, graphs, linear equations, and then some other kind of representation. Well, when we conclude labs, we typically get together as a class to try to look at all of the results that we found and see if we can reach consensus about what it all means. This year is going to be a little bit different because we can't do that face to face. And so what I'm going to do in this video is model the kind of questions that we're going to try to answer when we do this, hopefully in the future, uh, and how we answer those questions. So how do we look at all of our individual results and conclude something together as a class? So that's what I'm going to model for you guys in this video. So here I've got at least the graphical representations, our position versus time graphs for each of the four different cars, and the linear equations that came from the data you collected and these graphs. So the first thing we want to do when we look at all of our data analysis is just ask the question, what's the same about our data or our graphs or equations, and what's different? In our conversations about those similarities and differences, we can hopefully learn more. So when we look at our graphs and look at our equations, what seems to be the same? One thing that should jump out is that all of our graphs are linear. There's a linear relationship between position and time for each of the four cars motion that we looked at. When you look at these two graphs, it looks like the slope is about the same. So you might be tempted to say the slopes are the same. Well, notice the scale is a little bit different. The top one goes from zero to 125. The bottom one goes from zero to 100. So the best way to get an accurate representation of the slope of each of those lines is by looking at the slope in the equation. So remember, this represents the slope of our line up here, and this represents the slope of this line. They are, in fact, different. So they have different slopes. However, when we look up top here, we can see that this has a slope of 28.5 centimeters. This one has a slope of negative 25.9. The sign is different, but the value of the slope is approximately the same. Similarly, when we look down here, the values of those slopes are about the same. 11 centimeters for each and every second compared to 13 centimeters for each and every second is pretty close compared to the slopes up here. Another similarity could be the y-intercepts. Notice for car one and car two, they have pretty similar y-intercepts, 17 centimeters and 20 centimeters. Remember the y-intercept is where our graph is going to intercept or intersect the y-axis. In this case, it's our position axis. Similarly, over here, they have high y-intercepts. And so the y-intercepts and the slopes, there's some similarities between groups and other differences. So let's see if we can get into a little bit more to explain uh, what those similarities and differences actually mean. So after observing similarities and differences, on the right, these are the kind of questions we're going to try to answer in these kinds of investigations. So number one, what does the trend of the graph represent? We already said that it's linear. What does that tell us? Uh, number two, what does the slope of the graph represent? We got these values, a number and a unit. And that it's not just a number. It means something. It tells us something about the thing we're investigating, in this case, the toy car. Third question we're going to try to answer is, what does the y-intercept of the graph represent? Remember, we said sometimes they're similar, sometimes they're different. Here I've picked video two and video three, which have pretty different y-intercepts and pretty different slopes. And then the last thing we're going to do is figure out uh, what's a general form of an equation that we can come up with to describe the motion of any toy car or any object that moves like a toy car. Remember, these equations um, only tell us, let's say, what the position of an object will be if we know the time for the blue car in video number two. Or this red equation only tells us the position the car will be at for any specific time for that specific car. And we want to generalize our results, not just have specific results. So the first question is, what does the trend of the graph represent? Well, we noted that it's linear. 
and we said before that when a graph is linear, that means the y-axis, in this case the, posi the position values, are changing linearly with time, which means that each and every second that goes by, the blue car is changing its position by the same amount. Or in the case of the red car, its position is decreasing over time. Well, it decreases some amount of position in one second, some amount of position in the second second, and another amount of position in the third second. And we can see with a linear relationship, it's changing that position by the same amount each and every second. So that kind of gets to our second question, which is, what does the slope of the graph represent? Well, our blue car, in this case, in video number two, had a slope of 11 centimeters for each and every second. And the red car, in video number three, had a slope of negative approximately 26 centimeters each and every second. So what is it that this number, well, the sign, and the number in these units are telling us about our car. Well, if we look at the videos, we'd see that all of the red cars are traveling faster than the blue cars. And notice we have a higher value slope. And think about what are these units telling us? Centimeters for each and every second. So for the blue car, that means it travels or it's, it will move 11 centimeters for each and every second. It's like we could say the centimeters per second I want you guys to think about this like centimeters for each and every second. So the blue car travels positive 11 centimeters in each and every second, and the red car travels negative 26 centimeters each and every second. So these slopes are actually telling us two things. The number is telling us how fast the car is going, its relative speed. Uh, if you're going faster, you're going to cover more centimeters for each second of motion. If you're going slower, you're going to cover, cover less centimeters for each and every second. So number one, the slope tells us how fast or the speed. And what does the positive or negative sign tell us? Well, if we look at the red car, which has a negative slope, it starts at a high position and it's going back towards the position of zero. In the video, that meant it was moving to the left. Uh, with the blue car, its position is increasing over time. It has a positive slope. That means it's going away from a position of zero. And in the video, that meant it was moving to the right. So our slope, which is everything in these parentheses, tells us two things. It tells us what direction it's traveling in, positive or negative, and how fast it's going. 11 centimeters each and every second, or 26 centimeters each and every second. Okay, so what about the y-intercept? We've got these values right here. For the blue car, it was about 20 centimeters, and for the red car, it was about 92 centimeters. Uh, with any y-intercept, remember, it's going to be what the y value is when the x value is zero, or in our case, what the position value be, will be when the time value is zero. So when, like, where was it at time zero? That's what the y-intercept represents. At time zero, the blue car was about at a initial position of 20 centimeters, and the red car started to the right and moved back to the left in the video. At time zero, it had a initial position of about 92 centimeters. So the y-intercept on a position versus time graph tells us where it started or its initial position. So now that we know what the slope represents and what the y-intercept represents, we can finally answer this last question, which is, what is the general form of an equation that would describe the motion of, of a toy car, at least that moves at a constant speed. Remember, that was something that we observed in our pre-lab discussion, was that all these cars' speed were not changing. We couldn't tell a, a change in speed. So let's take the equation, the specific equation of our red car, and let's now generalize it using what we've just discussed. So what did the slope represent? We said it represented both the speed and the direction of the object. The value in units, that's the speed. The sign represents the direction. Turns out in physics, we have a, a word for that. An object's speed and direction is known as velocity. Our y-intercept, we said, represented the initial position of the object. Where was it at time zero? So let's get to our general equation. So if we can replace the slope with what it actually represents and the y-intercept with another variable which is what it represents. This will be our general equation. So we have x or position is equal to velocity multiplied by time plus the initial position. And it turns out that 
even though we observed that the car's speed didn't change, it might have changed just minutely a little bit as it was moving. And so we would actually say that what we were measuring was the average velocity, how fast it was moving on average. And so the slope is not just velocity, it's average velocity. And the variable we use to represent average velocity is, uh, well, V for velocity, and the bar over it will represent average. So we have X, or the final position of an object, is equal to its average velocity multiplied by time plus its initial position. And this equation right here is a general form. It actually is the general form of all the equations we came up with, whether it's for car one, two, three, or four. And it turns out that th this would also work out for any object which moves like the toy cars did, which meant its speed stayed constant. And so we can now use this for any object whose speed doesn't change. So we're gonna take it just a little bit further so we can introduce a few other ideas from this. So our general equation is an equation and we can rearrange it however we want to based on the laws of algebra and it doesn't change the relationship itself between these variables, final position, average velocity, time, and initial position. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract the initial position, x sub zero from either side. So it's gonna get rid of it on the right-hand side and we'll add it to the left-hand side. So we get that the final position minus the initial position of an object is equal to its average velocity multiplied by time. Anytime you take a final value minus an initial value, that gives you the change in that value. So if we take final position minus initial position, that gives us something we call the change in position, how much the position changed. And in physics, we have another term for that. We call that displacement. So final position minus initial position is displacement. We also have an another shorthand way of representing the change in something. Uh, and we do that using a Greek symbol called delta. And it's just a little triangle, that's the Greek symbol and that means change in. So if we want to represent the change in position, we'd use a triangle, which means change in, and then we'd put the variable for position, which is x. So delta x means change in position. Remember, we just named that displacement. So we get our final version, well, one of our final versions of our equation that, that the change in position is equal to average velocity times time, or we could say that the displacement of an object is equal to its average velocity times time. Or if we rearrange this, this equation right here, if we divided each side by the change in time, we could solve for average velocity. We get that the average velocity is equal to the change in position over the change in time. Or, so we could use this to calculate what the average velocity of an object is. We just take its displacement or change in position over the change in time, how much time it took to change position by that much. And again, like we said, we can use these equations for any object um, that either moves at a constant speed actually or changes speed because this is, again, figure out not how fast something is going at a specific instant in time, it's, fig it's figuring out how fast something is going on average over some amount of time.